Okay, I think we're going to get started. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming back. I was slightly concerned I might have overloaded you yesterday, so I'm very pleased that you have come back for more today. <laughs> Thank you. Is my volume all right for the people in the back? Yes? Good, excellent. Okay, so let's get started with our first case study. As I promised yesterday, we're going to have a series of case studies for the remainder of the week now. And our first one is set in Belgium, uh, in Brussels, and we're going to be focusing primarily on Victor Horta, the famous Art Nouveau architect who was very active in uh, Brussels. Now, Belgium, uh, as an artistic context, I feel has been very understudied, especially in the Anglo-Saxon context. Um, and that's a real shame because Brussels, Ghent, and Antwerp were really um, vibrant cities during the 1890s, and there was a lot going on. And especially in Brussels, we have the most avant-garde city in Europe at that time because we have a very strong native school of symbolist painters and symbolist poets. And I just want to point out uh, one of the most important symbolist po um, poets, Maurice Maeterlinck, who, um, of course, was the, um, he was a Nobel Prize winner in 1911. He was given the Nobel Prize for Literature, and he epitomizes really symbolist poetry. He was obsessed with death and uh, indulged in morbidity, which is very much uh, a symbolist uh, trait. And I think the most famous uh, piece of his writing is probably the Blue Bird. But some of you might remember him from the Vienna class, because he, of course, also wrote The Seven Princesses, which was the um, influence or the point of departure for Margaret McDonald's wonderful Cesso panel for the Warndorfer Music Salon in 1902. So symbolism is very important uh, in Brussels. But we, of course, also have an extraordinary flowering of Art Nouveau architecture in the city. And uh, as I briefly mentioned yesterday, this uh, incredible flowering of the progressive arts in uh, Brussels and in Belgium at large was very much to connect it to a particular group of artists known as Les Vins, the 20. And Les Vins, uh, the group was established or founded, if you want, in Brussels in 1883. It went very strong for 10 years. And then, as is often the case with uh, these kinds of artists' um, formations, people started to fall out with one another. They started to fight over aesthetic visions, over who got to hang their works where in the exhibitions. So it was a very uh, conflict-written, but also a very dynamic uh, group that then dissolved in 1893, but uh, was picked up under a new name, the La Libre Esthétique, and I'll speak about that in a moment, which then went from 1894 to 1914. So we really have 20 years of an incredibly creative and uh, experimental phase in Belgian art. And the chief aim of this group of Les Vins, as they originally founded themselves as, was to, on the one hand, provide progressive, forward-looking, avant-garde Belgian artists with a platform to show their works. So they organized exhibitions, and they had this wonderful journal, L'Art Moderne, in which they published uh, critiques and uh, treaties and uh, poetry, etc. So they had an art artist's journal. So that was one aim, to promote members of the group. But they also were very keen to expose Belgian audiences to the best of European and American modern art. 
So here we again see this kind of internationalism that I was trying to uh, talk about yesterday, this interconnecting network of progressive artists, designers, and architects who are in exchange with one another across the continents. Now, Levin is very interesting because they did not actually promulgate or push a very specific uh, artistic program. But as I said yesterday, they were very much interested in bringing together the most promising, the most modern, the most of their own time artistic forces from Belgium and abroad. And as is the case with so many of these artists um, groups that form in the 1890s, and I'm just mentioning the secessions in Berlin, in Munich, in Vienna, which had a very similar agenda, they very much reacted against the government-sponsored triennial salons that took place uh, in Brussels, Antwerp, and Ghent. So it took place in a different city every um, year. And artists really were agitating to take their careers into their own hands. And in that sense, I think they very much modeled themselves on the Impressionists, right? Which uh, is the group of artists who, in 1874, first exhibited outside of the Salon in the photo studio Nadar. Now, as I said, it was a very mixed group. Uh, we have key figures such as James Enser in this wonderful self-portrait I'm showing you here on the left, self-portrait with masks from 1899. And some of you might know Enser's work, and he uh, often painted these carnivalist worlds turned upside down, and masks play a really important role in his work. We also have, uh, and we saw uh, a painting yesterday, Fernand Knopf, who's a key figure in Levant. But we also have lesser known and maybe even more traditional uh, artists who are members. And I'm showing you here or thinking about someone like Jean Delvin with this uh, painting Ox near a fountain. <coughs> And just to mention uh, Enser, there was a wonderful recent exhibition. Um, it's literally closing this weekend at the Royal Academy in London, which uh, showed um, Enser paintings, but it was actually curated by Luc Tismons, and I hope I'm pronouncing this uh, name correctly, who is, of course, a contemporary artist. He's often aligned with Marlene Dumas, who is, of course, the famous South African contemporary artist. So he curated this wonderful Enser show at the Royal Academy uh, that was very successful and critically um, highly valued. So uh, the kind of international artists that were invited by Levon were also a bit of a mixed bag, if I may say. We have, on the one hand, uh, individuals who are, of course, key figures in the European avant-garde, such as Paul Gauguin. And I'm showing you here his wonderful self-portrait with Yellow Christ from 1890. We also have um, Whistler being shown. Uh, but then we also have Leva inviting more conservative artists like Josef Israels, whose uh, painting Peasant Family from 1882 really kind of epitomizes um, his, his artistic practice. But important to us, thinking about international art nouveau, it wasn't all about painting, although, of course, the symbolists and the international art nouveau architects and designers uh, had a close relationship with one another, actually a relationship that I think needs to be um, further explored by art historians. There's some work that really still needs to be done to tease apart the complex and complicated relationships between these two. But anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, Levant also exhibited decorative arts. They focused primarily on painting and sculpture, but because uh, Henri van de Velde and Victor Horta were very influential members of Levant, we also have uh, especially arts and crafts artists being brought to Brussels, and we have a very strong Belgian response to works, for example, 
by William Morris. I'm showing you his wonderful tapestry, medieval-inspired tapestry, Woodpecker II from approximately 1885, and then Walter Crane, whom we already met yesterday as the first president of the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society, his iconic Swan Russian Irish design for a wallpaper. The other thing I wanted to mention about uh, Belgium is that Belgium and France had a very close relationship with one another. Many of the radical intellectuals from France often found exile in Belgium. So for example, when Victor Hugo had to flee after Napoleon III say, seized power in 1851, he went to Belgium. Or when Charles Baudelaire uh, had to go into exile between 1864 and 1866, he also went to Brussels. So there's a very, um, one could, could maybe suggest that there's a very uh, sort of receptive welcome to progressive, if not radical, ideas uh, in Brussels and in Belgium. And of course, this, this interchange between France and Belgium is also um, part of the, or also comes about because of the close proximity between Paris and uh, Brussels. And, and actually, a lot of Belgian artists end up studying and working in Paris. And Victor Horta is one of the figures who spends time in Paris before he sets up his practice in Brussels. So what I really want to emphasize here is that Belgium and Brussels, which is the context for Victor Horta's work that we're looking at today, was an incredibly dynamic, incredibly experimental, and very forward-looking artistic context, both in the visual arts, but also uh, opened up um, the, uh, the doors of the Levin exhibitions to the decorative arts. And I would certainly say that the decorative arts played an important role in the Levin exhibitions because of Victor Horta and Henry, uh, Henri van de Velde. So this is Brussels uh, roughly around uh, 1900, and this is the urban context within which we need to place Victor Horta. Now, Horta worked as an architect and a designer during a period of large urban redevelopment in Brussels. And this urban redevelopment was initiated by King Leopold II, who had come to the throne in 1865. And I'm showing you here a photograph of him on the left-hand side. And this urban redevelopment scheme was in part financed uh, by government money that he um, was given by parliament, but it was also in part financed by his own private funds. And his pockets were deeply lined with money that he had acquired through his exploitations of the, um, of, of the Congo. And I'm showing you here on the right uh, a, a really wonderful caricature, actually, that was published in uh, the British magazine, Punch magazine, in uh, 1906. And it shows a Congolese rubber collector who is literally entangled, who, uh, whose life is squeezed out of him by a snake that features the head of Leopold II. So in many ways, this large urban redevelopment initiated and financed by Leopold um, provided the kind of infrastructure as a city for new architecture to, to come up, to spring up. So one could say that Leopold put the infrastructure into place and the middle classes, the industrialists, those who had come to money, populated these new urban spaces. And Leopold had very ambitious plans for his capital city. He wanted to build an elegant system of boulevards and avenues. And I'm showing you here um, a postcard of the Avenue de, and ex uh, please excuse my pronunciation, Tervuren. 
uh, which of course is the very site on which Josef Hoffmann's Palais Stocklet uh, is situated but it's not the only uh, avenue, but you can see how he really modeled his program on uh, Hausmann's remodeling or, or regeneration of Paris from the 1860s onwards. So Baron Hausmann tearing down many of the sort of small alleyways and old medieval uh, houses to make room for these uh, very representative tree-lined uh, boulevards. And it's along these kinds of boulevards that the new houses from the well-to-do, from the upper middle classes went up. And it's the architects such as Victor Horta who are starting to get the commissions for these kind of uh, new uh, houses. Now, Leopold himself was, as you can imagine, not a patron of the progressive arts or design or architecture. He only once decided to adopt International Art Nouveau for one of his buildings. And when he did so, he only did it for the interior presentation of a museum collection. So what I'm saying here in a very complicated way is, in his Musée du Congo, he, of course, it's a very typical Beaux-Arts historicist building, but the exhibition space uh, designed in 1897 is the only site inside uh, that, that Leopold actually commissioned uh, architects from uh, Art Nouveau like Paul Hanker or Henri van der Velde to design the space within which to set the objects that had been pulled out of the Congo. And you can see some of the Art Nouveau features uh, in the trestles, for example, trusses for the ceiling here, in some of the decoration here in the panels. So it's a very mild, but it's a nod towards international Art Nouveau. But that's as far as he went in supporting this uh, modern style. His favorite architect was this individual, Alphonse Ballat. And um, Horta actually trained with Ballat, so uh, he is important to us, even though he was a conservative architect. And Horta indeed hoped that he would become, that Horta would become Leopold's next royal architect. But this unfortunately did not materialize because Horta was a very difficult character and he made so many enemies he refused to collaborate with other, dis other designers so that he basically moved himself out of any possibility to become the next royal architect. <coughs> he did work with Ballard on this wonderful greenhouse development in Laken. And um, this is actually an important early commission uh, for uh, Ballard and for, for Horta. And um, it's important because he learns to build in a way that then uh, plays into his domestic architecture. So this um, is um, a set of, of greenhouses that uh, employ, of course, the new technologies of cast iron and glass in, um, as architectural materials. But they also employ these new materials and new technologies for, te uh, for decorative purposes. And I'm showing you here the main glass and iron dome of um, the, the greenhouse. So, so again, what I'm trying to say here is they, this is an important project for Horta to have been part of because this is where he, what is it, cuts his teeth, learns his skills, learns his trade of working with these new materials, with glass, with iron, with really industrial uh, materials. And so with this uh, royal, with this position as the royal architect falling through, never coming to fruition, as well as a lack of uh, forthcoming official commissions, Horta chose a different route. And he decided that he was going to cultivate a group of private clients who uh, he would um, encourage to build, or to encourage to use him to build their new apartments along the avenues and in the suburbs that I just uh, spoke about. So he opened his own practice in Brussels in 1890. 
and uh, between 1890 and 1903, he designed 24 houses. So that was his most productive period, really. And Horta was very, very smart and very strategic. He joined the Brussels Freemasons in 1888. And that, of course, enabled him to establish a series of contacts to important patrons, such as the Tassels, we'll look at that house in a moment, the Solveys, another house we'll be looking at, the Vinks and the Hallets. So he, he, of course, believed in the Freemasons and the sort of public good that this body uh, was engaged in, but he was also very, very smart in, in sort of affiliating himself with the kinds of individuals that he wanted as his patrons. And I have this wonderful quote by Horta where he, where he talks in his biography about joining the lodge, the Freemasons. Quote, after joining the lodge to devote myself to the public good, I, in fact, only made friends there with people whose profession prevented them from taking public action or taking an interest in political matters, and whose character led them to move more towards privacy and beauty than towards the masses and general vulgarity." Unquote. <laughs> Very humble individual he is, isn't he? Because, of course, he's the one who will offer beauty and um, yeah, privacy. Okay, so um, let's start looking at some of the houses that uh, Horta designed uh, for these um, patrons in, in Brussels. Um, his first major client in Brussels was Emile uh, Tassel, and uh, he built a house for him, and he had met Tassel, as I just mentioned, through the Freemasons. And the Hotel Tassel, in, you know, um, the, the Tassel house, was Horta's first independent building, and it was Brussels' first Art Nouveau building. Now today, it's the seat of the European Food Information Council. That's a mouthful. Uh, and it's not open to the public, unfortunately. The building represents a key moment in Horta's development as an architect. Because he used this early commission, 1892-1893, to break free from the kind of historicist styles that revived a past that we looked at a little bit with uh, the opera in Paris, for example, yesterday. And he was able to, by breaking free, create what he called, quote, a personal and living architecture. And by that he meant an architecture that was free of the laws imposed by past styles. <laughs> And in this architecture, he used glass and iron, which, as I mentioned, he had learned his skill of using it in the uh, greenhouses that he designed. He used this knowledge and applied it to a domestic space. And this enabled him to develop an entirely new type of facade, a facade that I would like us to think about as a rhythmic facade, as a um, facade that is not static, a facade that has a dynamism and an energy. And I think this is particularly uh, carried, the weight of this dynamism, this rhythm, and this energy is, of course, carried by the uh, bow window that you see um, right here. And I'm going to show you uh, just a little uh, detail right here which is really one of the key features of the uh, facade. And what Horta did here that was so revolutionary and that enabled him to build this personal and living architecture was that he uh, showed, he laid bare the iron structure that actually enabled the window to become a bow window. 
Now, in terms of architectural uh, or building techniques, uh, the Beaux-Arts architects were very well aware of these kinds of um, uh, cast iron uh, skeletons almost of a building, but they would, of course, hide that structure. They would cast it into uh, pillars, etc. Not Horta. He uh, exposes the uh, breast beam, which is this big beam. Think of it like a lintel right here, prominently. It doesn't hide it. He also, sorry, I got off mic, did I? Sorry. Uh, he also exposes, of course, the metal columns that support the structure and enable him to open up the space to have this big uh, window, this big span of a, of a wide um, opening. And he also shows the corner irons. Oops, sorry. Um, right here, the corners right here also lay exposed. Now he needed all of this structurally to make that kind of a large opening, but he used it to his advantage, made it an aesthetic feature, made it something that was of beauty. It becomes a decorative feature. So it's, a modernist would say it's a certain honesty to the structure of the building. So what's important about the Tassel uh, House is that it is a uh, building that, for the first time in Horta's career, introduces this kind of a curved line into his uh, facade. Don't worry about the floor plan. <laughs> um, I just wanted to so, show you one, one quick thing, because it's, of course, notoriously difficult to talk about the, the built environment when you're not actually experiencing the space. So the house, as you see it here, was really built in three parts. And this is why I have this uh, plan here. We have a uh, house, a brick house, in the front of the plot right here. And then we have another traditional, conventional brick-built house towards the garden in the back. And the revolutionary thing that he did is he connected the two structures with a um, glass-roofed iron structure, a steel structure that he covered in glass. So this structure here served to connect the two parts of the building, but it also served to house all of the, what I would call, infrastructure. So it contained the staircases and the landings. So the means through which the users of the house could get to the different floors, the means through which they could um, move through the building. And uh, Horta was very, very uh, detail-oriented. He played great, uh, paid great attention to detail. And you know, I said earlier he didn't like working uh, with collaborators or with others. He was the kind of notorious micromanager who had to be in charge of everything. So he created, the, he designed the door handles. He of course designed all of the ironwork and the woodwork. He designed panels and windows in stained glass. And I'm showing you here this wonderful stained glass window. Um, sorry. This wonderful stained glass window at the top of the landing here. But he also designed mosaic flooring, which you can see here, as well as uh, the furnishings or some of the furnishings of the house. So he really created this total work of art that I was talking about yesterday. He integrated a lavish decorative scheme or lavish decoration with the general architectural structure. But it didn't mask that structure. And that's what was new and what was progressive about this building. Now, he put uh, um, the central staircase, 
So let's, let's walk into the building just to orient ourselves. So on the left hand, the left hand uh, photograph is actually the entrance. So you can see you walk into this alcove, into this very protected space. It's almost like you're, it's very Macintosh actually, or Macintosh uh, uses that device a lot as well, and a lot of Glasgow building have that. It's almost like you're going from the exposed, open, busy street into sort of a cave-like structure. It's an important transition psychologically from the open, vulnerable into sort of a cocoon almost. So you enter through this door, which has uh, a wonderful uh, stained glass uh, organic floral bulb motif. And then you come onto this, uh, so you come into the door, you go up one set of stairs, you enter this uh, small landing uh, which has the mosaic, and you can see that really well actually in this drawing. So this is the door, you come in, it's the first landing, there is a uh, waiting room here and a cloak room right here, and then this wonderful um, structure here, the staircase is actually right here and across from it is, is an empty space and then you come uh, up another set of stairs and you come to a door and I'll show you that in uh, a moment. So here we go. Does that make sense? So you got the entrance door, this is that round mosaic, to this side you have that staircase with that wonderful uh, arabesque design that we'll be talking about. You come up another set of stairs, you cross here, and then you get to this point. And this is really where then the brick structure starts again, the more private spaces. And these doors here that you can see, they're now glass doors only. They used to be stained glass doors as well. So as you transition from the entrance hall and the waiting area where you deposited your coats and you were waiting to be called, you gave your carte de visite and you were waiting to be called in, you could see another door. So the inner sanctuary, so to speak, of the house was closed off, but it was stained glass. So it was this wonderful entire you know, you could sort of see something through it. You had this wonderful colored light flooding through it, but you were still not part of the most intimate spaces of the house. And the house was built for family whose members like to entertain. So it was very important to make the entrance hall on the one hand as welcoming as possible, and again, as I just mentioned, Horta achieved that, I think, extremely successfully by combining the practical, i.e. the dropping off of your coats, the waiting to be shown through, with the aesthetic, with the beautiful, with the symbolic. Because it was such an open space, that was flooded with light from the top. Remember, it was a, a glass roof. That it really was an open space. And it offered these vistas for the visitors to have all of this interest to look at, these interesting aspects of this space that they were in. And as I said, the, they were then called into, from the entrance hall into the interior of the house where they then went through this set of double doors. Now, the most iconic, of course, photograph that comes out of the Tassel House, and that is reproduced in every discussion of uh, modern architecture and of international Art Nouveau, is this wonderful staircase. Horta did not like enclosed spaces or solid doors. Uh, because he felt that they really shut down circulation. They hindered the circulation of people, of air, and of light. And he believed very strongly that a staircase should not be a gloomy, imposing, ceremonious kind of space or structure. Instead, he wanted it to be lit. He wanted it to be inviting to be used for a stroll through it. And for this reason, he introduced this light 
on top, this light well, and you can see the effect of this light filtering through from the top onto the staircase uh, in a really lovely manner in this particular slide. So light and atmospheric effect was very, very important to Horta. And he constructed his clients' houses in such a way that he could take advantage of maximum light. And not just natural light, but stained light filtered through stained glass. So he was very keen to um, create these atmospheres, as I said. And, and remember, we were briefly talking about the total work of art yesterday. And it is this atmosphere that really brings together the built environment where all of the components, the furniture, the architectural structure, um, the, the carpets, the mosaics, all the ironwork, where all of that comes together. And if that is then bathed or based in a wonderful, warm, glowing light that comes in through a stained glass, you immediately have this exp aesthetic experience, an experience of beauty, an experience of something that's beyond the mundane and the everyday. And as I said, this was all made possible because he was able to use new uh, technologies of, on the one hand, reinforced concrete, which uh, was, was used uh, by many other architects. But uh, he, as I said, uh, used um, steel construction and glass construction and left that open and exposed. So that had an important role to play in this total work of art. It was not just the skeleton of the building that was then clad over. It was left exposed. Um, and another thing about Horta was that he really, uh, and again, I think that comes again from his training uh, and the work that he did in Laeken, he loved to build winter gardens into houses that he designed. And often they were right in the center of residences. And I'll show you a house in, in a little bit where you can see the winter garden right in the center. And the winter gardens weren't there to cultivate their rare plants necessarily, but they were there to flood the space with light and to engender the kind of aesthetic pleasure and delight that I was just trying to uh, describe in a little bit of a clumsy way, I think. <laughs> um, so this building, the Tassel House, is a landmark for Horta, and it's a landmark for the history of Art Nouveau architecture. Uh, the floor, the ceilings, and the walls are decorated with arabesques. That's these things right here and here on the uh, railings. And these kinds of arabesque echo the sinuous lines that I was showing you yesterday, for example, in Hermann Oprist's uh, whiplash uh, embroidery. So this is uh, bursting with energy. It's bursting forward. It's rhythmic. It's alive. It's organic. It's inspired by nature. Because these arabesques are actually plant stems. Or he, he, he takes plant stems, uh, think of briar roses growing all over, uh, as his point of departure to abstract them into these arabesques, both on the wall and on uh, his railings. And he famously said uh, that he, uh, quote, took from the plant the stem, not the flower. And I think that's a really lovely quote because it, it um, it sort of crystallizes a difference to French Art Nouveau, because the French Art Nouveau artists think about Emile Gallet, think about Guimard. They, of course, took the flowers, right? The flower was the driver for the French. So um, art historians have long compared these kinds of lines that I described with the kinds of color schemes and the absolutely extraordinary manipulation of color and light to uh, Japanese prints. So Japonisme, as we briefly talked about uh, yesterday. Oh, here's another uh, photograph where you can see the plant stems. 
And it's actually quite a steep staircase, isn't it, when you uh, look on the slide on the left-hand side? Because that's the staircase that actually then gets you up onto where the stained glass window is. Um, sorry? Did someone say something? No, sorry, I thought you said something. Uh, so uh, art historians have linked that to uh, some of the um, visual language that, of course, was very familiar to many of the progressive artists coming in through uh, Hokusai prints, for example. I think it's a bit of a um, t difficult argument, but I can see how it might work in the Tassel's house, because Tassel actually himself was an avid collector of Japanese art. So I'll just leave it at that, and you can make up your own mind about the link to a Japanese aesthetic. OK, let's look at the uh, Hotel Solvay, which he uh, built between 1895 and 1900 which is a very different house from the one that I just showed you, the uh, Tassel house. This was uh, the uh, home for Armand Solvay, who was the son of the chemist and industrialist Ernest Solvay. And Ernest Solvay is a really interesting uh, figure because he and his brother actually founded the Solvay company, uh, and they uh, patented uh, the use of um, or the production of sodium carbonate in the so-called Solvay process. So they basically made soda, late 19th century soda. And Armand, so the son of this uh, set of brothers who had made uh, a fortune in this process, uh, in this uh, company that they founded, he got married and he wanted to create a family home. And so he purchased uh, a plot of land on the Avenue Louise to build this family home. And this is quite an unusual uh, lot or plot for uh, Brussels because it is, as you can see, much wider than the Hotel Tassel, for example. It's actually 15 meters wide, which gave Horta much more space to work with than usual. His usual domestic commissions in, in Brussels are these skinny townhouses. And in his memoirs, Horto had the following to say about this uh, commission. He wrote, quote, I was received into that particular milieu because the audacity of picking me, a sure sign of energy and independence, demonstrated, albeit in a different way, the energy required by the Solvay brothers to invent their soda. Unquote. <laughs> it's not a fantastic quote. Um, let's have a look at the inside. Very different uh, space than the, the sort of stripped back, very, almost, you know, tassel house. So I'm showing you here on the left-hand side the grand uh, store staircase, which starts out. So you come into the house through the door here. You come up a single staircase, and then the staircase, in a very sort of traditional way, splits off into uh, two staircases. On the uh, landing, you have um, a paint, sorry, a painting right here. So that would be sort of facing here. And then I showed, wanted to show you uh, Again, these uh, stems, these plant stem inspired uh, railings for the staircase. And have a little, pay attention to this little bit here, because that is an absolutely amazing uh, double fan skylight. So um, the facade really, it is this uh, quite impressive um, a facade, and it has these two symmetrical bow windows. But I would certainly say it gives no indication of the kind of um, spectacular and, to my view, almost a little bit over the top uh, interior that it opens up into. And the house, again, was lit from the top by two light wells. One in the north, sliding the uh, stairwell, and you can see that here. Remember I was sa saying, look at the little corner? This is the double fan skylight, stained glass lighting the uh, grand staircase. 
And it ends, the staircase ends in the bel etage where you have then on top that skylight. And a second light well then takes over from that space and illuminates the rest of the um, staircase and house leading to the more private floors. And that's not as spectacular. Um, uh, um, a fair, a skylight, so and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a photograph of that. So as the simple facade, or fairly simple facade, belies an extremely luxurious uh, interior. And uh, this uh, painting right here is by Theo van Rijsselberg, uh, the famous um, Belgian artist. It's called uh, Reading in the Park, and it's from, he took a long time to complete it. Um, it co was completed in 1912, and he's a, a neo-impressionist painter who uh, you'll see in a moment was extremely in, um, influenced by Seurat and Seurat's pointillism. Here are two rooms, the sitting room and the, the smoking room. They're both located on the bel etage. Um, the sitting room being in the front and the dining room at the back. And I, I think you can see that the, the interior is very opulent and that uh, the sort of predominant color scheme is these warm oranges and burnt sort of caramel colors. And um, art historians have talked about this set of rooms as being uh, a really successful uh, interweaving of structure of the house itself, of forms, the furniture, the lighting, the paneling, all the details you see, and the color schemes that are used. So again, we're looking at a total work of art. And here is uh, the painting that I was uh, showing you earlier on the first landing, which is by, uh, as I said, Reiselberg. And the house itself, I think, employed a whole series of, um, maybe we can best see it here, of lush materials, painted decorations. Look at the carpeting of the staircase. So it is a much more luxurious and opulent house, I think, than the uh, tassels, um, domestic spaces. And this particular house is still in private ownership today, although it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So what did Horta do with his own space, with his own house, when he built it in the Rue Américaine? Uh, between 1898 and 1901. So this is now the Horta Museum. So those of you who have been to Brussels might have been there. Uh, it's uh, accessible, obviously, to the public. So in 1898, Horta bought two parcels of land, again, double plot, on which uh, he intended to build his house for his family and a studio, so his architectural practice. And I think the facade shows in a wonderful the way the uh, double function of this space. So the large windows on the second floor of the studio building, which is this part, are obviously the windows into um, his drawing rooms, not drawing room as in domestic space, but for the architectural practice. So this part of the house is where his um, business is located, and this is where he and his family uh, lived. And I think it's nice that he actually made that distinction in the very facade of the building. The uh, studio door is more narrow than the door into his home. So he made a lot of lovely, clever, very subtle, nuanced adaptations to really create this impression of two different usages of this quite large um, building. And the narrative of the uh, house, of the, this space here, is of the facade is really one of an aquatic uh, landscape. We have the protective grill, oops, sorry, do I ever learn? We have the protective grill of the windows here 
in the shape of grasses. We have um, irises, abstracted irises, as the design on the balcony right here. And then, most wonderfully, uh, we have these abstracted dragonfly um, wings on the uh, balcony up here. Can you see? Like the Lalique brooch I was showing you yesterday. And here is the main staircase in the house. And I think I have another, yeah. So um, this is <laughs> vertical alert. This is looking straight up onto, again, the cast iron and glass covered roof over the staircase. And here you can see um, the staircase, the, the culmination of the staircase. And here, look, he's using mirrors to actually make this quite narrow space look larger and opening it up. Here is the dining room. Uh, and it's uh, a wonderful dining room. The walls are covered with white glazed brick, and it doesn't really come, and I, I've put on purpose these two slides, because this one's way too yellow, and this one's kind of pale. So imagine the sort of middle uh, in terms of color scheme. But the uh, brick that lines all of the walls, this is the garden, reflects the light in wonderful ways on a bright day. So it catches and plays with the light that comes in from the garden. The furniture is set into the walls. You can see these alcoves. For example, the dresser, the dining room dresser, set into this uh, alcove. And that, of course, completely opens up the room. Right? You don't have furniture projecting out into the space. It's receding back into the space. And the focus of attention really is the dining room table right here. And uh, also have a look at the floor. He uses different kinds of marbles and woods on the floor. The floor is primarily oak parquet. I think that comes out very nicely in this slide. But the furniture is ash furniture. So again, remember how I was saying earlier, he always plays with different hues, with these warm colors. And I think in his employ of the woods and the veneers, that comes out very nicely. Here's another um, picture of the, uh, of the dining room. And here, um, so this is the dining room down here, and this is sort of an informal uh, sitting room right here, and this is, uh, of course, the staircase that we looked at already. Quick, quick look at uh, this house, because I just couldn't resist showing you this absolutely wonderful octagonal entrance hall. I think you get the idea, right? Entrance halls were incredibly important for uh, Horta. Now, this house was designed for Edmund van Etvelde, and he was actually the administrator of the Congo Free State in 1895 when he commissioned Horta to um, build this, this, to design this house. And this is another house that's um, made up of two brick structures, so two conventional houses connected by a glass covered, uh, in, this, uh, in this instance, octagonally shaped area. It's not so much an entrance hall here, though. I would certainly consider it much more of a, a space for circulation. And I just wanted to show you, it's a shame it's black and white, but it's a historical photograph from the late 19th century. So you can see how it was, uh, the kind of furniture that was in here, the plants that were in here. So while this photograph, of course, doesn't do justice to the wonderful play of light and the, the hues and the colors, it gives a really good sense of the, the structure of the space and these wonderful uh, columns. Um, again, with the uh, ironwork uh, and these in the shape of uh, flowers right here. So just to sum up, um, maybe we'll go back. No, we'll leave that one up. Horta had um, a preference for warm colors. Maybe we'll go to this space here. 
He used a lot of uh, rose reds, honey yellows, ochres, ochres and orange tones in his uh, schemes. He was also very particular about uh, using fabrics to accentuate the color schemes that he uh, had employed. And he actually often used Liberty fabrics uh, in his uh, houses. And he was really very committed to creating spaces that served as a retreat from the busy urban world. So uh, that was really important. It was a space in which you could relax, where you could forget about all the stresses and difficult situations that you faced with in your pre professional and uh, public life. So it was a space that, in its ideal manifestation, enabled the user to completely immerse themselves and to really tackle all of the senses. These light flooded wonderfully, quite human scale spaces. And that's, of course, the idea of a Wagnerian uh, Gesamtkunstwerk. Huerta also immortalized nature in an intensely stylized manner. He was very fond of, as I said, the flower, stem, and the root motif. And we can find that motif all across his domestic houses. So I would really like to label him as the master of organic design. That harkens back to my inspiration I was talking about yesterday of nature being so important to Art Nouveau architects. But he abstracted nature, right? He used natural form, but he was interested in the underlying structures that, um, he, that one found in nature. And Horta also uh, designed furniture and built, got furniture uh, built. And I'm showing you here uh, a fireplace and the bookcases from uh, Van Edfeld's um, house. So again, every, every component of a space he was in charge of. And electric lighting was important, not just natural lighting, because of course we have evenings and we have winters. Uh, so he, he also uh, thought very carefully about how to best deploy this new technology of electric lighting uh, versus gaslight, which was still very much in use in many uh, cities. And he attached this electric lighting to um, supporting structures that, again, are like these star-like sinuous uh, lines. Can you see this here, for example? Um, these wonderful uh, interplay, again, between nature and technology, between artificial lighting and the organic. So he brings these contracts, uh, contrasts together. So Horta was really a master of um, bringing together contrasting surfaces and materials, wood and metal, wood and marble, et cetera. And as I said, he was one of the first architects to use industrial materials and building uh, techniques in domestic architecture on a large scale. And this allowed him to completely change what the buildings look like and the facades in particular, because he was able to eliminate load-bearing walls on the interior and he opened up the facades through these bow windows, for example. So the structure and the look, the structure and the, the core were closely and inextricably linked. And I'm going to close by uh, looking at this ready-made brick uh, lining of the walls in his uh, dining room in his own home. Because one might certainly think that this was a cost-effective measure, possibly, because he could use these industrially produced materials. But what that, of course, doesn't take into account the incredible workmanship that is required. If anybody has ever laid any tiles in a bathroom or in a kitchen space, you know how difficult it is to line them all up. And uh, he, Horta famously observed about his own dining room that, quote, it would have been better to have constructed the whole of the ground floor in marble because such great care was needed to fit the bricks, unquote. So, um, 
I'm going to finish here for today. And tomorrow, oh dear, tomorrow we're going to look at Macintosh. And I was just going over the lecture this afternoon, and I have way too much material. So um, I hope we will get through some of this. But thank you for your attention today. And I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.